Hello everybody, in this short video I want to quickly show you a way to solve the exercise 2 in homework 3 and especially the the part B where you were asked to plot the functions and find the roots of the function. So some of you solved the lane hampton equation analytically for some parts which is um, uh, very good. Some of you just looked up the plots online or in textbooks, which is also okay, or plotted it using Wolfram Alpha or MATLAB or some other program, which is also fine. But I just wanted to show you a way to solve this using numerics, so writing your own small program and yeah, getting the, the solutions for the lane Hampton equation. Now, in this short video, I'm gonna use Python so if you have never heard of Python or you don't know anything about programming, you're still welcome to uh, to watch the video. But I'm not gonna go into the details of um, how programming works because yeah, this is just supposed to be like a really short instruction. Okay, let's start by looking at the lane hampton equation that you can see here. So as you can see there are two derivatives in this equation and uh, we're gonna solve one after the other. So we're gonna define a function that we call f1 that is simply this part in the brackets on the left hand side which then you can see that this part in the brackets is just equal to an integral of the right hand side of the lane Hampton equation. So by doing this we can determine f1, the content of the bracket. And then inside this bracket there is another derivative, so we have to integrate once more to finally get the function theta. Alright, so we have these two integrals that we have now to solve numerically, and for this we're gonna use a uh, IPython notebook, so the Jupyter construction, which we're gonna switch to now. Alright, so first of all we're gonna load in some useful stuff into Python and something for plotting as well this is not necessary, it's just gonna make the plots nicer that we're gonna produce later on and now we can think about our program so we have to do these integrals that I showed you before and uh, for that we have to first of all define our integration width, so the the width of the bins that we sum up basically, because numerically we have to do a discontinuous um, uh, sum instead of an integral. And here we're gonna choose a d xi, like the bin size of 0 0.01. We're gonna do 1000 of these bins, which means like 1000 radial steps if you want. And uh, then we can uh, start like looking at the loop. So we now declare n which is like the theta to the power of n and we want to let this run from let's say 0 to 8 so we just or 0 to 7 in this case in range 8 and uh, then we start with the initial values so we say xi initially it should be not exactly zero because as you will see we're gonna divide by xi later on so we have to be careful that it's not exactly zero otherwise the code won't work then theta at the initially it's supposed to be one at a position where xi is almost zero theta by definition is um, supposed to be one and then our function f1 initially at Xi equals zero, we set it also to zero. Okay, and now we can start to sum over the bins. Ah, before we do that, we have to also declare our um, solution. So the solutions, they will be stored in this theta solutions, which is uh, like this, and then Xi will be stored in Xi solutions. Okay, now for i in range of the number of radial steps that we want to do, we're gonna do something. 
And first of all, we will calculate f1, so the thing that is integrated, the bracket that is integrated over the xi values. Now this is simply going to be a sum, so the initial value plus, and now we have here minus xi squared. If you don't remember the function, you can go back in the video where we had it in the beginning, and then times theta to the power of n and times the bin size which is stick size. So this will calculate f1. It is basically our first integral. And then as we have seen before, our second integral which defines then theta is simply the sum over f1 divided by xi squared times the bin size d xi. Alright, so now the only thing, this um, will determine our theta, the only thing we have to do now is to attach these values. Uh, before we do this, also our xi, it is simply the initial value plus the added on bin size. Okay, so then we have theta solution, we append to it the newly calculated value and then the same we do for xi and this already gives us the solutions for theta and xi and now we only have to plot them so for this we use the function plot and we define xi as the x variable and theta as the y variable and then we only have to say show out here okay so uh, this is already good but we want to see a bit more so we set some limits for x and for y and since we're interested as the last step in the In the points where these functions become zero, we're gonna plot the zero line to see the, the crossings. Okay, so now we can also numerically um, see where these functions cross zero. For this, we can simply define a, a if an if statement. So we know that if theta is initially positive and then in the next step negative, then it had to cross zero in the time between and of course the other way around as well so we say now that uh, if theta solution of i is smaller than zero and theta solution of i minus one which is in the step before if this was bigger or equal to zero then we're gonna do a print of first of all the n we are currently looking at and then the xi so basically the position where this happens and then we can do exactly the same thing for the opposite crossing so if theta goes from negative to positive where we just have to switch the signs here basically and now we do this and we see okay for n equals zero it goes through zero at 2.44 for n equals 1 at 3.14 and so on. So we have for n equals 0 we have 1 crossing, for n equals 1 we have 3 crossings only in the in this limited area between 0 and 10 and then for n equals 2 we have it crossing 0 one time and for 3 also one time. The others as you can see in this limited area they don't have a crossing. So we've seen that for n equals 1, 2, 3, there are some crosses through 0, but now let's take a look. We only looked at from 0 to 10 and there was nothing for the rest of the functions. So let's set this a bit higher, or maybe even to 10,000. And uh, we don't have to look at the first 3 anymore, so we're going to save us the time. 
and just for n equals 4 to n equals 7 we're gonna take a look if there is like a root and here you can see that there is actually at 15.2 for n equals 4 it goes through 0 now the last thing that we can do is to check how good our result is that we get for this for this root for n equals 4 and for this we decrease the bin size a bit and uh, we see that now for the bin size that we had before the, the value that we got was 15.2 and we make it a bit smaller and the value that we get now is a bit more exact and it differs also from 15.2 a bit but now if we see we make it a bit smaller even then it almost does not change anymore okay that's basically all I wanted to show you I just think it's valuable to notice that some differential equations they don't have analytical solutions but it is still possible to solve them numerically and even though it is not that elegant or that significant in that to solve the equation in that way it still gives you values that you can work with and that you can uh, explore okay that's it